Economic impact of British rule on India. Britain's relationship with her Indian colony was one of political subordination, but economic exploitation formed the core of this relationship. This process of colonization was geared clearly to benefit the mother country, even at the cost of the colony that was India. Colonial exploitation was carried on broadly through three phases. The first phase, that is 1757 to 1813, of mercantilism was one of direct plunder. In this surplus, Indian revenues were used to buy Indian finished goods to be exported to England. In the second phase, that is between 1813 to 1858 of free trade, that is, India was converted into a source of raw material and a market for British manufactured goods. The third phase, that is from 1858 onwards, was important. It was one of finance imperialism in which British capital controlled banks, foreign trading firms and managing agencies in India. This phase exploitation was carried out through a range of economic policies, primarily in the industrial and agricultural sectors of the colonial economy. The first phase is generally dated from 1757 to 1813. From here, the British East India Company acquired the rights to collect revenue from its territories in the eastern and southern parts of the subcontinent. The company's monopoly over trade with India came to an end by 1813. The British had come to India in the 17th century purely as a trading company. They were backed by an exclusive royal charter to trade with India from their queen, Elizabeth I. They set up their first factory on the banks of the Hooghly River in Bengal. The company had managed to acquire permits or a dastak from the Mughal emperor that exempted it from having to pay duties on its trade. This led to a great deal of corruption among the employees of the company as the farman was widely misused by them for their private trade. It also meant heavy losses in revenue for the Bengal governors, later Nawabs, in way of custom duties. This became a contentious issue and one of the chief factors which led to the Battle of Plassey, which was fought in 1757 AD. The primary functions of the East India Company in this period was to buy spices, cotton and silk from India and sell them at huge profits to the large markets these goods enjoyed in Britain. This meant that large quantities of bullion would flow out of Britain into India to pay for these commodities. Now, despite efforts, it seemed difficult to find British goods that could be sold in India in exchange to balance the outflow of Indian goods. Besides the expenditure on buying commodities, the company also spent very large amounts on the wars that it had to fight with other European powers who were all in search of the same goods to trade in. These included the Portuguese, the Dutch and the French. Thus, the acquisition of Diwani, that is, the right to collect revenue in Bengal after the Battle of Baksa opened the way for the company to raise money for its expenditure in India. After the Diwani of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa was granted to the East India Company in 1765, the maximization of revenue from the colony became the primary objective of the British administration. Agricultural taxation was the main source of income for the company, which had to pay dividends to its investors in Britain. Therefore, the British administration tried out various land revenue experiments to increase their revenue income. These experiments also partly determined Determined the relationship that the colonial state would share with the people it governed. In 1772, the governor of Bengal, Warren Hastings, introduced a system of revenue farming in the province of Bengal. In the system, European district collectors would farm out the right to collect revenue to the highest bidder. This system was a total failure and ruined the cultivators because of the arbitrarily high revenue demands and no support to the cultivators. To undo this disaster, Cornwallis introduced the system of permanent settlement in 1793. Under this system, Zamidars who early only had the right to collect revenue were established as the proprietors or owners of land. The state's demand for land revenue was permanently fixed, but if the Zamidars were unable to pay the full tax on time, the lands would be taken away and auctioned by the state. Through this system, the state tried to create an enterprising class of landowners who would try to improve crop production in their fields to earn profits. Besides, it would be simpler for the state to deal with a limited number of zamidars than with every peasant besides a powerful section of society 
would become loyal to the British administration. But the system led to greater impoverishment of the tenant cultivator because of the burden of high revenue assessment. It also caused great difficulty for zamidars, many of whom were unable to pay the revenue on time and lost their lands. A large number of traditional zamidars collapsed. The system also encouraged sub infuditaries, that is, many layers of intermediaries between the zamidar and the cultivator, adding to the woes of the peasantry to keep out intermediaries from revenue collection. This was done by the Rayatwari system, which was started by Alexander Reed in 1792 for the Madras Presidency. Later, it was introduced in the Bombay Presidency as well. Under this system, revenue was initially collected from each village separately, but later each cultivator or rayat was assessed individually. Thus, peasants, not zamidars, were established as property owners. Although the system increased the revenue collected by the state, the assessments were faulty and the peasants overburdened by the taxes. The landed intermediaries continue to flourish. In the north and northwest of India, the Mahalwari system was followed after 1822, where the state made settlements with either the village community or, in some cases, the traditional talukedar. Each unit was called a mehel. Under this system, some recognition was given to collective proprietary rights. As a result of the revenue policies of the British, agriculture stagnated and peasants almost became tenants at will. They also increased the number of landed intermediaries and strongly entrenched the figure of the money lender in the countryside. Landlords and zamidars became an important class and collaborators of British colonial rule in India. The acquisition of Diwani rights meant that the company could now tap the wealth of local rulers, zamidars and merchants in the rich province of Bengal where he shipped to Britain. The acquisition of Diwani rights meant that the company could now tap the wealth of local rulers, zamidars and merchants in the rich province of Bengal and use them to buy the goods that could be shipped to Britain for sale. Large quantities of wealth, including illegal incomes of company officials, made its way to Britain from Bengal. Company officials amassed huge fortunes before they returned home and they were referred to as Nawabs in Britain on account of their flashy lifestyle. A lot of this money was used to fuel the industrial revolution in Britain. The greed for incomes from land revenue also led the company to pursue an aggressive policy of territorial expansion in India. The second phase is generally seen to have begun with the Charter Act of 1813 and ended in 1858 when the British Crown took over the direct control and administration of all all British territory in India. Now, the company lost its monopoly trading rights in India. As the company's profits grew, the support they enjoyed from the British government became precarious. Earlier, many members of the parliament had East Indian interests who used the company's resources to maintain their patronage within the government. But as unprecedented levels of industrialization were achieved in Britain, there was a gradual change in the constitution of the parliament. Adam Smith's book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, heralded a new school of economic thought which critiqued the idea of the companies enjoying exclusive monopolies and lobbied for a government policy of free trade or laissez-faire. In a bid to acquire greater control over the company's earnings, the parliament started attacking individual company officials with charges of misconduct. The free traders dominant in the parliament demanded free access to India, which led to the passing of the Charter Act of 1813, thus ending the monopoly enjoyed by the company in India, while subordinating its territorial positions to the overall sovereignty of the British Crown. Free trade changed the nature of the Indian colony completely. Firstly, it threw open Indian markets for the entry of cheap, mass-produced, machine-made British goods which enjoyed little or almost no tariff restrictions. The passage of expensive handcrafted Indian textiles to Britain, which had been very popular there, was however obstructed by prohibitive tariff rates. Secondly, British Indian territory was developed as a source of foodstuff and raw material for Britain, which fueled rapid growth in its manufacturing sector, crucial to the emergence of a powerful 
capitalist economy. These changes reversed the favorable balance of trade that India had enjoyed earlier. This phase laid the foundations of a classic colonial economy within India through the complex processes of commercialization, of agriculture, and deindustrialization. It is often believed that the colonial administration encouraged the commercialization of agriculture, which improved the position of peasants in many areas of the Indian colony. From the 1860s onwards, the nature of agricultural production was determined by the demands of the overseas market for Indian primary products. The items exported in the first half of the 19th century included cash crops like indigo, opium, cotton, and silk. Gradually, raw jute, food grains, oil seeds, and tea replaced indigo and opium. Raw cotton remained the most in-demand item. The expansion in cash crops production was accompanied by the building of railways after 1850 to improve trade networks. But commercialization seems to have been a forced artificial process that led to a very limited growth in the agricultural sector. It led to the differentiation within the agricultural sector but did not create the figures of the capitalist landowner as in Britain. This lack of any simultaneous large-scale industrial development meant that accumulated agrarian capital had no viable channels of investment for it to be converted into industrial capital. Initiatives to expand the productive capacity and reorganization of agriculture was also a risky proposition as the sector catered to a distant foreign market with wildly fluctuating prices while the colonial state provided no protection to agriculturists. Commercialization thus increased the level of sub in the countryside and money was channeled into trade and usury. The larger part of the profits generated by the export trade went to British houses which controlled business like shipping and insurance. Industries besides commission agents, traders and bankers. Those who benefited in the colony were big farmers, some Indian traders and money lenders. Commercialization further intensified the feudal structure of landlord money lender exploitation in rural areas. The so-called process of commercialization which was supposed to lead to capitalist agriculture was often carried out through very exploitative and almost unfree forms of labor. Tea was grown in plantations in Assam owned by whites and they used unindentured labor which was almost like slavery. White planters had to force farmers to grow indigo because it yielded low profits which upset the harvesting cycle. This involved inhuman levels of coercion which eventually led to the Indigo Rebellion in 1859-60. Commercialization did lead to limited phases of success in the cotton producing areas of Western India in 1860s and in jute production in Eastern India, but they were because of increase in demand rather than capitalist innovations in production and organization. Farmers were forced to grow cash crops also because they had to pay the high revenue rents and debts in cash. The shift away from food crops like jowar, bajra and pulses to cash crops often created disaster in famine years. A decline in world demand for Indian cotton led to heavy indebtedness. Famine and agrarian roots in the Deccan cotton belt in the 1870s. The jute industry collapsed in the 1930s, which was followed by a devastating famine in 1943 in Bengal. Although these famines have been widely debated by historians, it is undeniable that the aggregate production of food crops remained far behind population growth and millions of people died of starvation and epidemics. Among the limited steps that the colonial government took towards improving agricultural production included the construction of some irrigation canals in northern northeastern and southwestern part of India. Permanently settled eastern India got left out of the government initiative. The revenue maximization and limited famine relief in extreme situations were the factors that motivated this public investment. It did lead to a great prosperity in commercial agriculture in limited enclaves, especially in the canal colonies of Punjab, but it was confined to a smaller number of already well-off farmers 
who could pay the high water rates. It also encouraged the cultivation of cash crops like sugar, cotton and wheat while reducing the production of millets and pulses. In some cases, like the United Provinces, it did not suit local conditions and caused swamps and excessive salinity. In 1853, Lord Dalhousie took the decision to construct railways in India. But the construction of the railways in India only further strengthened the colonial nature of India's economic development. The railway network made it easier to penetrate the interior markets and sources of raw material in the colony and link them to port cities instead of linking internal markets to each other. The railway network was thus primarily geared to serve the interest of foreign trade. Railway lines built in frontier regions would facilitate army movement and some famine lines were built in scarcity areas. Moreover, the whole project was built with British capital and investors in Britain were guaranteed 5% interest which was paid out of Indian revenue. Most of the high level expertise and railway equipment like machinery, railway lines and even coal to an extent was imported from Britain. Thus, it ensured that the multiplier effects of constructing the railways also remained absent in India. Among other factors, the penetration of the interiors of the country was made possible by the railways had another grave fallout, the ruin of the Indian handicrafts industry, which had enjoyed patronage both from local ruling elites and market overseas. With the expanding control of the British, traditional native courts disappeared. The British also enforced an unequal tariff system whereby the entry of Indian commodities in British markets were restricted by high custom duties. In turn, the Industrial Revolution in Europe enabled the mass production of cheap machine-made goods which flooded Indian markets. Unable to compete with this, Indian commodities lost their overseas and domestic markets. This destructive process led to deindustrialization that increased pressure on land. The third phase is seen to have begun from the 1860s when British India became part of the overexpanding British Empire to be placed directly under the control and sovereignty of the British Crown. The period was one of finance imperialism when some British capital was invested in the colony. This capital was organized through a closed network of British banks, export-import firms and managing agencies. Although the process of colonization had been divided into stages, one should keep in mind that this periodization is in some ways arbitrary. The third phase was merely a consolidation of the trends that were already witnessed clearly in the second phase. It may be more useful to study these phases as heavily overlapping where new and more subtle forms of exploitation existed alongside older, cruder forms. However, the new development that marked out the third phase was an intensification of the rivalry between developed and industrialized countries for colonies in Asia, Africa and Latin America. In the 19th century, countries like France, Belgium, Germany, the United States and even Japan witnessed rapid industrialization. In the face of competition in the world market, Britain led in this regard dwindled. In search for newer markets and sources of raw material, these countries stepped up the drive for colonies and strengthened their control over existing ones. Industrial development also led to capital accumulation, which was concentrated in a smaller number of banks and corporations. The capital was invested in the colonies to sustain the rapid inflow of raw materials to fuel further expansion of industrial production. High tariff restrictions in other developing countries led to a contraction of markets for British manufactured good and the need for heavy imports of agricultural production into Britain was making her position vulnerable in her trade with other countries. India proved crucial in solving the problem of British deficits. Britain's control over India ensured that there would always be a captive market for Lancashire textiles. Moreover, India's export surplus in raw material with countries other than Britain counterbalanced her deficits elsewhere. While on the one hand, indigenous handicrafts faced impoverishment, on the other hand, there were few attempts at developing modern industries in the colonies. Although the colonial government spoke about free trade, indigenous enterprise 
faced many obstructions perpetuated by the state's discriminatory policies. British capital was initially invested in railways, jute industry, tea plantation and mining. The Indian money market was dominated by European banking houses. British entrepreneurs had easy access to capital made available by this banking network, while Indian traders had to depend on family or caste organizations for their capital needs. British banking houses and British trading interests were well organized through chambers of commerce and managing agencies and could also influence the Canulian state to carefully deny Indian entrepreneurs access to capital. Before the First World War, British managing agencies controlled 75% of industrial capital and most of the profits from this limited industrialization were also sent back to Britain. But in spite of heavy odds, Indian entrepreneurs found opportunities to expand and grow whenever Britain underwent periods of economic hardships. It was during the First World War that some Marwadi businessmen from Calcutta like G.D. Birla and Sarup Chand, Hukum Chand invested in the jute industry. Gradually, their control started expanding into other areas like coal mines, sugar mills and paper industry and they could even buy up some European companies. The greater success of Indian capital was seen in the cotton industry invest in India, which took advantage of high demands during the year of wars like 1914 to 1918 to consolidate its success and eventually was in competition with Lancashire, certain traditional trading communities like the Gujarati Baniyas, the Parsis, the Boras and Bhatiyas became important in this sector. The Tata Iron and Steel Company under government patronage provided leadership to the fledging iron and steel company of India. After the First World War, links with the foreign market was re-established. But again, in the depression years, that is from 1929 to 1933, the domestic market became relatively free to be exploited by indigenous industry as foreign trade declined. The Kalolian government also provided some protection to the sugar and cotton industries in the face of falling prices in the agriculture sector. Low prices forced capital from land into the manufacturing sector. Indians also ventured into the field of insurance and banking. Again, during the Second World War, as foreign economic influence declined, Indian entrepreneurs managed to make huge profits. Strengthened by its limited success, the Indian capitalist class strengthened their links with the nationalist movement. They soon started demanding the establishment of heavy industries under straight ownership and started organizing themselves to resist the entry of foreign capital. But to place these markers of success in perspective, on an overall level, these developments remained confined to the domestic market and indigenous capital still had a long battle ahead against the structural weaknesses of a colonial economy. The potential for growth remained depressed given the massive poverty of the Indian people. Early Indian nationalists like Dada Bhai Naroji, M. G. Ranade and R. C. Dutt had expected Britain to undertake capitalist industrialization in India, but were deeply disillusioned with the results of colonial industrial policies. Consequently, they formulated a strong economic critique of colonialism in the late 19th century. Dada Bhai Naroji put forward the drain of wealth theory. Poverty in India, according to them, was a result of a steady drain of Indian wealth into Britain, a result of British colonial policy. This drain occurred through the interest that India paid for foreign debts of the East India Company, military expenditure, guaranteed returns on foreign investment in railways and other infrastructure, importing all stationery from England, home charges paid for the Secretary of State in Britain and salaries, pensions and training cost of military and civilian staff employed by the British state to rule India. Even if this drain was a small fraction of the value of India's total exported, if invested within the country, it could have helped generate a surplus to build a capitalist economy. The ultimate question that has been asked of colonial economic policies in India is whether there had been any development at all. The answer to this question is not simple. 
we may start with looking at 18th century Mughal India before the British had entrenched themselves as an invincible territorial power. The view, the 18th century Mughal India was undergoing a deep economic crisis and decline has been pervasive among historians. But we have noted above that these half-hearted attempts at modernization were motivated primarily to benefit the mother country. Backwardness in the peripheral colonies needs to be seen as a necessary flip site of the Industrial Revolution in the core centre on the West. The same processes that led to industrialization in Britain generated and sustained backwardness in her Indian colony because the British economy was linked parasitically to the Indian economy in an integrated world economic system of free trade. India in 1947 was not at a pre-industrial stage and so her post-independence economic growth patterns may not be compared with the process of industrialization in the West. In 1947, India had already been a part of capitalist development in the West for 200 years, but in capacity of a colony. So, in 1947, independent India embarked into a process of modernization from a colonial mode rather than a traditional mode which was structurally backward and underdeveloped. Thank you till then.